All right, so the process for doing this first one is to find the average pressure, and that's located in the middle of the window. So if we take 11 feet times the 0.433 psi per foot, we get the, uh, you know, the pressure average. You know, it's less above and more below, but that's the average. Then multiply that by the area of the window. Be sure you got the area of the window in square inches. And multiply them together. And what you'll come up with then is the force on the window. All right. So, you got any questions on that? I'm doing all right. Okay. So that's the basics of, of figuring this stuff out. So let's say that we've got, what's the average size water main, just a residential water main? What's that? For a main? Yeah, I'd say about eight inches, kind of. The, that's usually the required size for residential. If you're kind of in a smaller street with a dead end or something, they might go as low as four. But, you know, in a, in a town the size of Albany, you're going to want eight, may, maybe six, but, but eight, let's just say eight inches. Okay. And I don't know, what's the average pressure in Albany for the water system? Anybody know? 34. Okay, 34 PSI. Let's say we've got a gate valve here. Okay. Now, what are the two types of valves that are typically found in water <coughs> systems? <coughs> Gates and butter, butterflies in the mains, anyway. Um, and and what when do you use a what, what's the breakout on that? Um, What, um, or actually, why don't we do, why don't we look at a height? Well, anyway, um, what's the breakout? When do you use either one, generally speaking? I mean, I guess, when would you use a gate valve versus a butterfly in the mains? Anybody know the, the kind of the decision on it? It's, it's basically, it's a size kind of thing. It's eight inch or below gates, 10 inch, generally 10 inch, 12 inch and above butterfly. They, they get gates get really expensive when they get big. Now the disadvantage of a butterfly, I mean butterflies are um, they're cheaper when they're big. Um, the disadvantage is you got this thing in the middle of the main now. So if you need to, uh, uh, get, yeah, if you need to clean it, if you need to do more than flush it, if you got to run a what they call a pig through it, you all know about pigs for cleaning mains, kind of like mm -hmm. foam, rough foam bullets. You can't do that when you got a butterfly valve in there. So that's a disadvantage, but it's a cost kind of thing. Um, all right, so let's say we've got an 8 inch gate valve in there and we're going to shut the valve. What's the, uh, what's the force going to be on that valve? Yeah, yeah, just go ahead and run the number. So gate valves are on off valves, right? What, what happens when you try and throttle flow with a gate? Yeah, it, it starts chattering in the seat. It'll wear them out. So you don't throttle with a gate valve. Gate valve is meant to shut stuff down, which is primarily what you do in a, in a distribution system. If you want to throttle, you might have to use a butterfly. Although those, you don't really want to, you know, if you're throttling way, way down, they, they get a little kind of chattery too because you've got a real small opening around the inside. So, you know, but you can throttle with a butterfly. Balls are really good to throttle with, but they, you know, they're really expensive uh, when you, like, you get bigger. I mean, you look at, um, what, corp stops? You know, corp stops and, and angle stops. Those are essentially ball valves. They're cone valves, but they're the same idea. They're good for throttling if you need it.
1700 or thereabouts. Yeah. Okay. So you, you get a heck of a lot of force built up in these things. Okay, and so you know, be aware of that in a water main. If you've got things like a fire hydrant or a T or something, you know, where the line ends, it's a heck of a lot of force trying to pull the pipe apart. So you have to be aware of that. Y'all getting about seventeen hundred? Yeah, a little bit over. Yeah, seventeen ten. Yeah. So just be aware of that. Regional. Uh, Now the one thing to remember is when you're doing things that are round, generally you spec them out by diameter. So just remember to take half of the uh, of the diameter before you do the pi r squared thing. Should get about 50.27, and then find the force. It's the pressure times the area, and that would be 34 pounds per inch squared times 50.27 inches squared. So 1709 pounds, okay. Doing all right with that? And you know, uh, one of my students told me a story once doing construction, I think it was down in Eugene. They had a dead end line they put in, they ran down a big hill. So here's the line right here and then here's the hill and and they pressurized it before they really uh, blocked it in and, and reinforced it and he said the thing just jumped out of the ground like a snake basically just because it was really pressurized and you know they had like a dead end on that thing and they hadn't really reinforced it. You know there's things you put in at the end of the line like a thrust block and all that, you know, to, to hold the things in, but they hadn't done that yet. It was right after they built it and they opened it up just to kind of pressure test it and the thing just came right up out of the ground. So got a little exciting, you know, for everybody there. Plus then you got all the water in the world flowing out of these things. You gotta try and shut them down then and that's that's a whole other thing too. So okay. So just be aware of that that you know you get a lot of pressure a lot of force building up in these lines. Okay. So we're good with that. All right, now another thing you can do now, that's kind of the basics of it. It's just pressure times area. Now, there's a few other kind of little things that come up here. One are hydraulic jacks. Okay, and this is a way of uh, moving where you apply a small force on, um, on one side of a jack, and you get quite a bit larger force out of the other side, okay? So you've got a picture of that in your uh, in your book. So what we're going to do, we're going to change the diameter of these uh, of these pistons, basically. And this is on page eighty-two. And we're going to push down on one side, and we're going to get a force on the other. So what we want to do here, the first thing I do on these is I find the area of the pistons. So I've got a one inch radius and a three inch radius here. So why don't we get these areas figured out? Because we're going to do forces here. Oh, and actually, I gave the radii of those, didn't I? Not the diameters. So we got radii. So I guess I spec these round things out by uh, by radius.
Okay, so uh, I got 3.14 and 28.27. That's what I got. Okay. Now, what you want to do is kind of work through this one. You want to start by getting the pressure on the first side. So P1 is F1 over A1. So what that's going to be is the 100 pounds that we're pushing with there divided by the area. So we ought to be able to get that pressure that's being applied on that side. Okay. And that gets you, you know, a fairly high pressure in that hydraulic fluid there, or whatever that. I guess that's what they use in those things, essentially. Now, this pressure here isn't really affected too much by the change in height, so we don't really think about that so much. You know, 31.83 pounds per inch squared is, is a fair amount of uh, pressure. A little variation in height isn't going to make much difference on that, so we'll ignore that. So essentially what we're assuming here is that the pressure everywhere in there is 31.83. All right, now, so anywhere in that fluid is 31.83, so how much force would you get out on the other side? So we're pushing down here on this side with 100 pounds, and what we want to know is what's this force over here? So what are we going to do here? We've got um, the force on side 2 is what? That's going to be... The pressure times A2, right? So we ought to be able to multiply that out and get the force. Yeah, pressure is the same everywhere. So what we're doing there, we're using the left-hand side to find the pressure and the right-hand side to find the force. That's what we're doing. And you could round this or whatever, right? When I run it, I get about 900 pounds. So we okay with that? We got any questions on that bit? Okay. So what you do is you use the side where you got a known force because you have to know what you apply. And to do using that, you can then find the pressure. And then once you got the pressure, you can use the known area on the other side to get the force out. Okay. So what you can do is you can change the dimension of those pistons and you can get uh, quite a lot more force out what, what do you lose? Distance. Yeah, distance is the price you pay to get more force. So, I don't know if they make these so much anymore, if they're available so much. I'm sure they'd make them, but I don't know how available they are. I used to have these little hydraulic jacks for jacking cars. Now they got the scissor jacks used all the time, but we had one of those when I was a kid. And, you know, essentially, you are lifting the car when you do that. You know, you, you, but you've got to move the handle just an awful lot, up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, to get just a little bit of rise on, on the car. So what you're doing, you're, you're changing the force you apply to the handle to a much bigger force that's needed to pick up the car, but the price you pay is you've got to really move that handle a lot, a, a large distance. 
Now on these hydraulic jack deals, there is a shortcut if you like, because if you look at these relationships here, the pressure is kind of the constant. So what you're doing, if you plug this, um, let's see, we plug, oh, this isn't going well, is it? I'll pick that up somewhere else. There we go. So let's take that and plug it in here. So what we'll get when we do that is we'll get that F, the force out, is the force in times the second area out divided by the area in. Okay. Now if we got round pistons like we do here, we could take F1 times pi times r2 squared divided by pi times r1 squared. Okay, And what's going to happen then are the pi's are going to cancel out. And what you're going to get there is if you take the force in times the ratio of the two radii squared, you'll get the force out. So in this particular case, what you could do is take that 100 pounds times 3 inches, which is out, over 1 inch, which is in, squared. And you'll get 100 times 9, which is the answer. Okay. So you could do this with a shortcut. You have to remember the shortcut. They don't usually have this on formula sheets. But that's a quicker way to do this kind of problem. If you're interested in that. All right, so we're good with that. That's just a quicker way to do it if you wanted to. So you just take the ratio of the radii or the ratio of the diameters. It'd be the same either way. Divide it out and then square it, multiply it by your initial force, and you'll get the force out. Okay. All right, I'm good with that. All right, so that's one of the things we look at are hydraulic jacks. Now, another thing we can look at is buoyancy. Okay. So buoyancy is what makes things float. What's that? Um, yeah, I guess you're right, right? Um, although you'd have to look at, you know, that boat's made, probably made of steel or something. It's not the specific gravity of the steel. It's the specific gravity of the whole boat. Yeah, right. What you look at is you look at the amount of water that's displaced times the density of water. And there's even something called Plimsoll lines, which came in in the late 1800s. And those are lines that calculate, based on the different temperatures of the different oceans where people are going to go, how much they can load a ship so it's still safe. And the lines vary depending on whether you're in the Caribbean or whether you're in the North Atlantic or wherever, because the density of water varies a little bit. So they, they have these lines on ships that indicate a full load, full safe load. I think they're called plimsoll lines. So they use that conversion of ballast to get the load. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that, right. And these came in in the 1800s is when they came in because there were ships that were sunk because right. they were loaded up. What's that? Yeah, because in the Caribbean. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah, right. And so, you know, that, that's when they came in. All right, so this boat floats because the water it's moved out of the way, which is called the displacement, displacing meaning to move. So the water that's moved out of the way by the boat equals the, the weight of that water equals the weight of the boat. And that ends up being an upward force on the boat. So the boat floats when what's called the buoyancy force, 
which is the weight of the water that was moved out of the way, equals the weight of the boat. And when those two things equal each other, the thing floats. Okay? That, that's how this works. So if you're in water, you're actually lighter than you are in the air because there's a buoyancy force acting on you. So, a fluid creates an upward force called the buoyancy force on a submerged object that is equal to the weight of the fluid displaced, which is moved out by the object. Okay. So, if the buoyancy force is greater than the weight, the object floats. If the buoyancy force is less than the weight, the object sinks. So if the weight is bigger than that buoyancy force, the net force is down and the object will sink. If the buoyancy force is greater than the weight, it'll push the object up to the surface. Okay, let's say we've got a sluice gate that's submerged. The gate is two feet by two feet by four inches thick. What's the net force on the gate? So why don't you find the volume of that gate? So you'll know what a sluice gate is. It's like if you have a, a dam or something, and then you've got, these are usually on smaller dams, that's how I think of them. You've got a pipe extending, you know, that goes to the flush with the surface of the dam. What you can do then is put a gate in front of that. It's just uh, usually wood or something like that that sits, kind of blocks off the pipe entrance. And then you've got usually uh, kind of, sometimes they have like a screw jack kind of thing where you can raise and lower the gate. Okay, so what we're going to look at is what's the buoyancy force on this gate. Okay. Now, get the volume first. Watch the four inches, though, because we want to be in consistent units. Yeah. So get that converted into feet. So 1.333 cubic feet. All right, now what that gate's done is moved that much water out of the way when it's underwater. Okay? So that gate has moved water out of the way. So that water is trying to come back in to that uh, volume there. So there's a force exerted on the gate equal to the weight of the water that's been moved out of the way. 
Okay. So what you do is you take the volume of water that's been displaced, moved out of the way, and multiply it by the density. Okay. So why don't you do that next? So find the the force of the water coming in, which is the weight of the water that's been displaced. So take the volume times the density, you'll come up with that. So that number in your book might be just a little bit off. It just depends on how you round. So. You'll get maybe 3.2. So if you want to find the net force, you got 83.2 pounds up and what, 66.39 pounds down? So, yeah, so it's going to be a positive upward force, isn't it? 16.8 roughly? Depends on how you're rounded, but I got about 16.8, I think. Yeah, okay. Okay, so that's pushing up. So that thing's going to float, is what it's going to do. If it were allowed to It'll do whatever it wants to do there. that okay. so that's buoyancy force Right now, the last thing here is, and we just went over um, 
how much force can build up in those things. I mean, just for 34 PSI, you got about 1,700 pounds in an eight inch line, okay, in a water line. So um, what you've got there is, a, looks like an elbow, an elbow, a 90 degree turn. And you see a gate valve in there. I don't know, maybe there is, is there a T? Is that by his right foot? Is that a line? I can't quite tell, but. But however, it's definitely going to have force going that way. Which, uh, so what you do is you put something in there called a thrust block. Now a thrust block is just a big old chunk of concrete is what it is. And what you're doing, you're, you're reinforcing the water line so you don't have water hammer just pulling it apart. And the thing with a thrust block is, yeah, the weight of the block helps. But really what you're trying to do is take this force here that gets thrown into that and transmit it back to the undisturbed soil in the back of the trench. See, when you dig up soil, you disturb it, and it's not nearly as strong as it was as it was before you dig it up. You know, if you notice, if you backfill something over time, it'll kind of settle a little bit. That you know, so once you dig up soil, you you, you really take away a lot of the strength of it. Okay, it just isn't uh, completely compacted. So what you want to do is get that force over to the trench wall where it's undisturbed. That's really what a thrust block is doing. So what you want to do here first is calculate the force in the line. And then after you do that, figure out how big, um, how big the thrust block needs to be to spread out that force so that the soil on the backside can handle it. So that's kind of two steps. Okay, so force is pressure times area. Okay, so thrust can kind of tear a water system apart at the joints. Now there's other ways to accomplish this too. There's fancy mechanical joints. You all know about the joints in water lines. Most of them, garden variety or push on, you know, this bell and spigot kind of thing, push them on. The pipes are so big and heavy and you got the backfill around them, it holds them together. If you get into special situations, the next step, the Extreme step is a flange, flange to flange connection, but that's strong. It's, it's very strong, but it's rigid and it's unwieldy. You know, this isn't uh, like plumbing in your house. These are eight inch ductile iron lines. They're heavy as can be. So you don't like flanging. You know, you probably use them on valves and stuff, but there's an intermediate valve called a, or connection called a mechanical joint. It has like a sliding collar and then a compressible gasket that you bolt up to a flange type connection. And you can add things to that. You can put set screws into that sliding collar so it bites into the pipe better. You can put rods from the collar back to the flange connection. There's all these different ways you can improve a mechanical joint. Um, see, the problem with thrust blocks is they're big chunks of concrete. You know, if you have to get in to work on that valve, now you got to get a jackhammer or something and chip that thing off, which you know, exactly uh, fun. So. You know, they, they try not to use them these days, but, but, you know, they're still a cheap, effective way to reinforce, so you'll see them a lot. Okay. But, you know, from a maintenance point of view, if you have to get one of those things off, it's not, there's nothing really tricky about it. You just take a jackhammer and, you know, go to work, and that's, that's kind of, that's, that's uh, difficult work. Okay, so thrust is absorbed by using reinforced pipe joints or thrust blocks. Thrust blocks are concrete blocks poured when the pipe is installed. You're just taking the force to the strong, undisturbed soil on the back side is what you're doing. So step number one here is to calculate the force. So this is called the working pressure, or actually the working force. So what you do to calculate this, um, what you're doing here is you're kind of turning bends with these pipes usually. So you're getting two forces that enter into it, kind of like that. So what you want to do is calculate what you call the resultant force, which would be going off that way. It's the combination of the two you've generated. Okay. So this involves a little bit of trigonometry here. And I won't get into the derivation of the formula, but you, what you end up doing is taking the sine of half the bend angle. So what you do is you take the working pressure first, 
Now that's a safe pressure. You're over designing these things because you don't want them to break. So you're willing to spend a little extra to over design them and over build them so they don't. So what you do is you, instead of using the actual pressure that you expect, you take that and you multiply it by one and a half. And that gets you what's called the working pressure. That accounts for water hammer and things that could happen to the pressure to jump it up a little bit, okay? So that P there, instead of being the normal everyday pressure, is one and a half times that, just to be safe, is what that is. A is the area of the pipe, and theta is the bend angle in degrees, okay? So that's basically how you calculate the force. So you notice you got that PA in there that you'd expect. You got to put a factor of two times sine a half the angle. It's just a trigonometric formula is what it is. So it's two times PA times sine of half the angle. P is one and a half times your expected internal pressure. Okay. So let's start with that. And let's say we got an 8 inch line with an internal pressure of 150 psi with a 90 degree bend. Let's find the, uh, the force first. Remember to take one and a half times the 150 psi. Okay. Now, I know you may not have had trigonometry, but what you have is a sine function on your calculator. The trig function. Um, so, you know, use your 90 degree bend and take half of that and then take the sine of half of it. okay with that? So you're using one and a half times the 150 PSI. It's 225 PSI. The bend angle's 90, half of that's 45. And then the area is pi times four inches squared, 50.27.
and you just multiply those all through. Sine of 45 is 0 0.7071. Y'all, y'all okay with doing sine on your calculator? If you haven't done straight, and y'all good with that? There's a sine button on there. S I N. Sign and then 45. Now there is this thing where you ought to be in uh, degree mode, not radian mode, but we're running out of time. When I just finish this off, we'll cover it a little bit more detail uh, next time. So when I just finish it, just to get it done, because we're about out of time. So using this formula here, you can get the thrust. So this is the force that you're designing for. And it's going to be pretty big here. It is 16,000 pounds or thereabouts. Would okay. you just use a material that could take that, or would you? What you do, you look at your soil, right. and the soil has a strength, was it 3,000 pounds per square foot? Mm -hmm. So they've taken that into the lab, and they know the soil can handle 3,000 pounds. Every square foot of soil can handle that. Right. So then you just take that, and you got your 16,000 um, pounds. You divide it by 3,000. Yeah, and that'll get your square feet. Okay. That's how big. That's how big the thrust block has to be. So when if you. It was made of earth. No, it's the concrete. What you're oh, okay. spreading the load through the concrete to the soil is what you're doing. Okay, that's the purpose of that. Okay, so you might have to, and I, well, my eraser won't work, but I'm about out of time here. But <laughs> ah, I'm blowing up here. But that's uh, that's square feet there. We'll, we'll knock it off. We'll, we'll cover this in more detail uh, on Wednesday. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll post it in Moodle. How about that? I don't know if I'm assigning all of them or not. I can't remember. Okay, let me shut this recording down. Yeah, that homework, uh, you can staple it there.